and then we'll get started. Um, by way of intro, my name is Scott McCormick. We've got some other guys here and maybe even some girls from in the Luke's friends category over there. Um, and that's cool too. We're continuing now our study of the gospel of John and we're going to pick up where we left off in John chapter three. So how about I'll open in prayer and then we'll get in the word. How does that sound? Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you. I, I still really enjoy these times to get together with other believers and to study the Bible together. God, you put your power in the Bible, the power to save, the power to transform, and I pray that you would use that tonight for the purpose that you intended. Lord, I pray that you bless our conversations, and I pray that you would keep distractions uh, out of our homes and our, our places that we're calling in from uh, for just this one hour so that we can focus on your word. Lord, we love you, and we cannot tell you thank you enough for the sacrifice that you made in your son, Jesus Christ. There is nothing that we can outgive compared to that. We, 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 can't, we can't do something, number one, to make restitution for our sins, but number two, we can never repay you for that sacrifice, and we're so grateful, Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right. Let's get started Amen. here. Um, my name is Mr. Scott. And we're in John chapter 3. And a couple of weeks ago, we finished up a conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. And we totally beat that horse to death. I mean, we had at least four weeks just on that one conversation. And it, they were important passages. And I'm, I'm glad for that. But we're going to make a flying leap to the end of John chapter three here um, with a conversation that John has with some of his disciples and a Jew. So let's begin reading. Um, and there's three of us, I guess, that can read here. So how about Ben, if you'll start us off, we're going to be at John chapter three, starting at verse 22. Uh, if you'll read 22 through 24, Matt, if you'll read 25 through 30, and then I'll read 31 through 36, and we're hopefully going to cover all of that today by 8 o'clock. So that means listen fast. That's what that means. All right, Ben, you're up first. All right. John three twenty two. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the Judean countryside, where he spent time with them and baptized. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. People were coming and being baptized since John had not yet been thrown into prison. <clears throat> then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing and everyone is going to him. John responded, no one can receive anything unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I am not the Messiah, but I have sent him, but I have but I've been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So let's break this down. Uh, in the past, we've been, and I, I'm going to draw my little map here again. So here's, here's the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. And we started at Bethany where John was baptizing. And then we went up to, um, in, into the land of Galilee. And there was a, a, a city up there called Cana. That was where the first 
uh, sign that Jesus did. That was where he turned water into wine. Then he went down here to Capernaum near um, the Sea of Galilee for a few days. And then he goes down to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is where the Passover feast was held. And that's where he had his conversation with Nicodemus. Well, now it says in verse 22, after this, this is after his conversation with Nicodemus. doesn't mean immediately after. It's just when he's done with his stuff in Jerusalem. He and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. Um, you'll see some translations that just say uh, they went into Judea. And um, both of the commentaries that I read um, wanted to make the point here in the ESV, it says countryside, but Jerusalem down here is in Judea. That Judea encompasses that. So really it just means he went out of the city. He went out into the countryside, out into the little villages and the little streams of water there and where the people were. And he was, um, he was with his disciples and among the people and he was baptizing them. Now, this is interesting because it says in verse 22, he remained there with them and was baptizing. But let's scroll just a little bit down um, on the same page here. Let's look at chapter four. We're going to look ahead for just a second in chapter four. Ben, uh, I think it's your turn to read again. Can you read, reread for us? Um, or read for the first time for us, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Sure. <clears throat> when Jesus knew that the Pharisees heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. Good. So he's going to, uh, in the very next chapter, he's going to turn around and go back to Galilee to continue his ministry. But here it says, in verse 2, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples. So here in, in chapter 3, it says he was baptizing. Um, this most likely means that he was teaching and his disciples were baptizing. And they were baptizing in his name. They were baptizing on his behalf. Um, it, it's sort of like he's the, the chief of this group. And when they're being baptized, he's getting the credit for that. Um, and there's a distinction being made here between the, the baptism of Jesus and the baptism of John. There's those who become disciples of Jesus versus those who were either new disciples of John or were originally disciples of John. Um, so Jesus wasn't actually baptizing, but he's out there amongst the people gathering disciples and followers and people who were listening to him. And in verse 23, it says, John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. Now, which John is this? There's sort of a hint there because it's in the sentence almost. But is this John the evangelist who wrote the gospel of John or is it John the Baptist? John the Baptist. This is John the Baptist. Now, um, this, this name John, and this is one of the things that's gonna sort of be born out of the conversation that we're studying today. Who remembers what the name John actually meant? What did that name mean? I wish I could write it in the Greek because it's beautiful and long. It's, it's nice and short in English, but what does it mean, that, that name John? I don't I have, have any of my note takers here. Sorry, I know we've talked about it before, but I don't. Yeah. <laughs> God is gracious. That, like his name literally is praising God, okay? It, and, and it's not just praising any, any uh, number of his attributes, it's praising his grace, okay? That's the, his, his name. And John the Baptist especially really pours out a representation of that name as we continue to read here because something's going to happen where he had opportunity to bring glory to himself, and instead, he does what he's always done throughout the rest of this gospel. He's going to keep pointing to Jesus. Now, at this point here, man, I read the most interesting, and I am not going to get into a debate about it in class. I got into this interesting uh, write-up about baptism, having read this passage. One, one of the commentators said, 
you know, right here it says they were baptizing at Anon. I can't even pronounce it. Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there. In other words, there's there's water all over the place. There's water here and there, and I can I can travel around gathering and making disciples and proclaiming Christ. And there's water nearby, so I can baptize them. And one of the points they made was that you know when John was baptizing in the Jordan River, that it was common for the Jews to just sort of walk out there, like like this but they weren't standing on the water. So pretend the water kind of cuts off. This part's underwater. That's, that's their leg underwater. And then they get out here in the middle of the water, and then they would just plop themselves down in there. And then they would come back up. And you can kind of imagine that John, the Baptist, if he's baptizing literally every person that walks out there, that's what he would spend his entire time doing. He wouldn't be teaching or, or, or calling out to the people. Or it's, it may even be unlikely that he could have put his hands on them and pushed them under the water and brought them back up, which is, you know, what we do in a baptismal, in a Baptist church, but that it was not uncommon for Jews when they would go through purification rituals, they would go out to wash, they would go out in the middle of the river, and they would plop down and come back up, and so, you know, we're Baptist, and we're, you know, we, we, we immerse, we dunk, that's what we do, and that's the biblical way to do it, and the conversation that, that I read in this commentary was that, well, that's what they did in Israel, because Man, it's hot there. You can get in the water and get back out, and you're not going to freeze to death. But he's the commentator wrote, can you imagine John the Baptist baptizing people in, like, northern England in the dead of winter in the 1800s when nobody has running water and hot water available? Is the only way for them to be biblically baptized to go freeze to death in the river and maybe even die? Or can we just sprinkle them? And I was like, that's an interesting point. So I'm not... I'm not saying that baptism by immersion is wrong. I still think it's true because every example we see of it in scripture is that way. But that was a point they made, and it came up in the context of there was a lot of water around, so that's why they were baptizing. Um, so, yeah. If y'all have thoughts on that, you can say it, but I literally won't debate it. <laughs> yeah. All right, so this part right here in verse 24 for John had not yet been put in prison. Um, not yet put in prison. Who remembers why he was put in prison at all? Because he called Herod out, right? He called out Herod for what? Doing something with, with a, a relative of his, right? Uh, he married his... Did he marry his brother's wife? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got sister-in-laws, and I mean, that's just that just feels wrong. And so John called it out for what it was. Now, what was always interesting to me reading those portions, and we could turn there and, and, and read more on that, but his name was Herod, and the lady he married, her name was Herodias. Like, it's literally that they had the same name, the boy version and the girl version. But it's important to point out here that here John has not been put in yet put in prison in all three of the other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Jesus' ministry and their descriptions of, of the gospel doesn't really start being recounted until after John has been put in prison. And so here we see John the evangelist who, you know, we know he wrote this probably 30 years later than the other gospels were written and he knows what content is in them and he's supplementing those histories he doesn't have to repeat them because those are already really well covered he's now supplementing he's backfilling portions of jesus ministry that were not covered in those other gospels and so he starts before john was put in prison and he talks about jesus ministry up until that point too so that's why that's why he points out parenth parenthetically there that John was still baptizing because he had not yet been put in prison. Now, something happens in verse 25. Uh, Matt, can you reread for us verses 25 uh, through 26? Yeah. <clears throat> then a dispute arose between John's disciples and a Jew about purification. So they came to John and told him, Rabbi, the one you testified about, and who was with you across the Jordan is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. Very good. So there's an argument that, that crops up, and it's between a Jew and John's disciples. 
Now, the, 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 the topic is listed as over purification. Um, not over purification, but the, the topic is purification. And because there's all this description about baptism here, it's possible that's what they were talking about. In other words, especially when they come to John and say, hey, that guy that you bore witness about, and they have a problem with him, they're talking about Jesus. It's likely that this Jew that they're having a disagreement about is now a disciple of Jesus. One of the things that is important for us to remember is that we're, we're not especially at this time, they weren't Jews and then separately Christians. At this point in time, followers of Jesus were Jews. No Gentiles were really brought into the fold here at this point. Now, Jesus came also to save Gentiles, uh, but at this point, you know, even, even after Jesus uh, dies and is buried and is raised again um, and, and then ascends into heaven, when the Christian church meets, they met at the temple. They met at the Jewish synagogue. They were just another group of the Jews. And it's not until, like, this gospel is written that we see the word Jew used separately from Christian this often. In the other three gospels, you get, like, maybe seven references to the word Jew combined. And in the gospel of John, you get, like, 70. Because 30 years have passed, and there is a more distinct uh, discrepancy between those who were followers of Jesus and those who remained followers of, of the, the, the Jewish traditions. So um, here when he says Jew, this, this was a Jewish man, but who was probably a follower of Jesus, had just been baptized by one of Jesus's disciples, and now we've got John's disciples, and they're getting an argument over which baptism is better. Well, I follow Jesus. I follow John. Uh-oh. Well, the John's disciples leave this conversation, and they come up to John, and I'm going to draw them here. And so here's John, and he's got on his, uh, his woolly coat that he likes to wear, and a staff, and I'm not going to draw the locusts and honey. And then he's got all these, these disciples here, and they come to him, and they're upset. They're so upset at this guy that they can't even name him. They say, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, the one uh, to whom you bore witness. They're obviously referring to Jesus. They know his name, but it's sort of like when one of my kids is doing something wrong and I say, honey, your, your son is over, there, is over there doing what he's not supposed to do, okay? And so, yeah, I mean, he's my son too, but I didn't say that. I said, no, that, that's your son. And they're kind of doing the same thing. They're saying, John, you're, that guy that you bore witness to, look, and he's over there and he's baptizing and all are going to him. What about us? What about us that remain faithful to you? Uh, I thought we were doing the right thing. They're frustrated and confused. And John, it could have gone a number of ways here. I mean, if we think about popular Christian leaders on TV, there's plenty of opportunity for them to talk bad about each other. Well, that guy, I mean, I love him, but, you know, he's wrong, okay, because what I teach is right. And, and John here is a, a prophet. He's a powerful prophet. He's the last of the Old Testament prophets. And he had plenty of opportunity to sort of revel in his success. If we were going to measure his success by modern lifeway standards, okay, we'd be counting professions and saying, look at all the baptisms that John the Baptist had, and he's a really successful pastor. And John the Baptist has a totally different reaction. He says, guys, y'all have totally missed the point. The guy that you're mad at right now, that you want me to be mad at to make you feel better about how you're feeling, do you not forget what I said when I talked about him? Let's reread that. Let's reread that. Let's look in verse 27 here. John answers them and says, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him 
from heaven. And here he's referring to his own success by the numbers. He's talking about the thing that they're taking pride in by being followers of him. He's saying, I've received that. That's not something I can take credit for. I've received it. It's been given to me. You yourselves bear me witness. In other words, you need to remember what I already told you. You tell it back to me now because you, were, you, you claim to be my followers and listening to me that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. So this whole time, I've been trying to tell you who Jesus is. I've been trying to point the way. And so here's, here, here's John, and he is always over here pointing. This is his pointing finger. Pointing to Jesus, who's over here baptizing other people. He's always pointing to Christ, and he continues to do that here. He had opportunity to take pride uh, in his work and in, in his success, and even in the loyalty of his followers here. And he says, you've missed the point entirely. It's all about that guy not me. It's all about Jesus, not me. It, it's all about him and the salvation that comes through him and not any of the other things that we can measure or take pride in as a church or as a pastor or as the last of the Old Testament prophets. None of that matters. It's about Christ. Um, and like a good teacher, he starts to paint word pictures. He, he does this well. Jesus does this exceptionally well. Let's reread verses 29 and 30. Ben, can you reread those two verses? Sure. He who has the bride is the groom, but the groom's friend who stands by and listens for him rejoices greatly at the groom's voice. So this joy of mine is complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. Very good. He draws a picture to a wedding. And this is really great because in many places in the Old Testament, um, the, the Jews were called the bride of God. And in the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Jesus. And so there's this persistent marriage picture in Scripture. And here he draws a, a specific picture about his role in the relationship here. So here's the groom, and I'm going to draw him with a top hat, okay? Because that's how they are on top of cakes. I don't know why. Nobody wears those. At weddings. If you do, more power to you, but I didn't have one. And then here's the bride, and she has on a, a gown that I am not going to do justice to because bridal gowns are beautiful. And she's got a veil. That's, there you go, a bride, a bride and a groom. And John says... The one who has the bride, the one who receives the glory, the one who people should be paying attention to is the groom. I'm not the groom. I'm the groomsman. I, in fact, I'm, I'm more like the best man. There's this, it's called friend of the groom. The friend of the bridegroom, it says in the ESV, he stands over here on the side. Now, I, I've been in both of these positions. I've been a groom and I've been a groomsman, or I've been a, a you know, a best man. And when you're in that position, nobody's looking at you. Like, no offense, but nobody's looking at you. They're looking up here at these folks because that's where the, that's where the important is. It, it, and no woman, at least no woman in the room, would dare take the glory away from the bride. That is her moment, okay? You wouldn't dare do that. And he says, the friend of the groom um, who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. And so one of the things for us to, to realize is that in this day and age that they were living at the time, the friend of the groom did more than just show up and stand in pole position in the lineup of groomsmen. He, he was actually involved throughout the entire marriage process. It was not uncommon for the best man or the friend of the groom to be the one who actually approached the bride to offer the groom's hand in marriage. He would be involved in negotiating the relationship between the two, that there's inter-family issues that they have to deal with. He would go in and actually inspect the wedding chamber 
and the bride chambers and make sure that everything was exactly the way it was supposed to go. And if the bride and the groom got in a fight, it was his job to mediate that. This is an important role, but it is still not the groom. And his whole purpose in all of that was to serve the groom. He's doing all of those things. That's an important job, but it's all in service to the groom because that's who is the most important in this whole scene. And so he says, I'm not the groom. I'm the bridegroom's. I'm, I'm, the, I'm not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And so he says, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. The one that I've been waiting for, the one I've been pointing people to, the one that I've been preparing Israel for, he's here. I can hear his voice. I can watch him go by and say, behold, the Lamb of God. And I'm excited to do that. And so in verse 30, he says, so he must increase, but I must decrease. There's two parts of that that I want to talk about. One is this, this, this wording, increasing and decreasing. Um, I, I heard a sermon on this passage one time where a story was told about a missionary. Uh, this was a missionary who went to, to live his life amongst a native people who did not have the Bible translated in their language. And he made it his life's work to learn their language so well that he could translate the Bible for them. And he got stuck on this verse because their native language did not have words for increasing and decreasing. Wasn't a thing. I mean, there's, there's languages out there that have no word for zero. And this, this native language that he was working in had no words for increasing and decreasing. And he, he was stuck. And he spent a lot of time among the people. And he spent some time with the chief of the, of the tribe. And the chief of the tribe told him at one point, he says, now you've met my son, right? Yeah. And he says, and you do know that he's going to replace me as chief one day. And he says, yeah, I get that. I understand that. And the chief said, that means that my son must set and his son must rise. And the missionary went, oh, oh, that's perfect. That's how I need to write that down. In other words, here comes Jesus. And if we're looking at this timeline here, um, we see the birth of Christ here um, at zero. I'm going to call that zero, like zero AD. And, and, and here comes Jesus as he's growing in stature and favor among men. And then at age 30, um, he comes to John and is baptized and he begins his ministry. And his ministry is sort of doing this number. Well, John started his ministry a little before that, like this. And now that the one that he's pointed to is here, John's ministry is going to start doing this. It's going to start decreasing until the point that he's executed. Now, he dies in service, all right? He, he doesn't go, oh, Jesus is here. I'm retiring. I'm, I'm going to retire to the Galilean countryside and make a little farm and have lots of little John the Baptists. And he doesn't do that. He, he dies in service to the Lord. He wasn't continuing to prophesy. He does not necessarily, like this, this conversation that we're reading is the last recorded conversation of John talking about who Jesus is and proclaiming him. There is um, two other instances. One is when he tells Herod, you're doing the wrong thing and he gets executed for it. Um, that's more of a teaching thing. He's just calling out sin where he sees it um, and, and being a voice of truth in society. Another is when he sends uh, an emissary, a messenger to Jesus and says, now, remind me, please confirm to me, are you really the Christ? And, and that's more just his weakness as a human. Um, but here he's proclaiming Jesus as Christ. And this is the last time we see that. And so his ministry really here does start to decline. The other thing I wanted to point out is this word must. We, we, we keep seeing this word must come up in John. Um, if we look back at John 14, John chapter 3, verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It has to happen. This is the same with Jesus. His ministry, his influence, 
his, his work of salvation must increase. It's going to happen because it's God who is doing it. And that's something to, to notice. Jesus, is, uh, Jesus doesn't, it's, Jesus is still increasing. Jesus is still saving sinners. Jesus is still building his church. And, and that's awesome. Like, this isn't like a, well, he's going to increase and then die, and then, and then that's it. You know, or he's raised again, and then that's it. Or, or then, you know, we get to 2020, and all the churches go online, and nobody goes to church anymore, and then that's it, right? Not, none of that. Jesus is still building his church. It must happen. He must increase. So, now, in my Bible, I, I'll pause here because we're about to get started a new paragraph. Do y'all have thoughts or questions? My, I, I just have one question. Do you think that the, the followers of John, their issue was strictly jealousy, or was there some difference in the baptizing process that they were upset about, too? I, I think it was jealousy. I, I think, and one of the things that one of the commentators pointed out that I was reading this week said— mm -hmm that these were men who followed John but didn't leave and go follow Jesus. we got to remember, the guy writing this book was one of the ones who was originally a disciple of John. And when John said, Behold the Lamb of God, they left and followed Christ. But these stayed, which means, yeah, they were following John, but they weren't listening because that was the whole point. Right. You know? And so they were jealous. The guy they were following is losing in popularity. The numbers are going down. We're looking at our attendance numbers, and we're, they're tracking down, and we're concerned about that. You know, what can we do to boost our attendance? That, these are the kind of words that they're using. And, and John's going, wrong measures, guys. This isn't what's important. What's important is Jesus. What's important that, is people what coming to ask, Christ. Uh, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if, if John's disciples, um, if, if John himself had convinced his own disciples, I'm not the guy, I'm not it, you need to go, you need to follow Jesus. So none of his disciples, um, I, I don't want to say converted, um, but is that is that factual? Did, did they indeed oh, just stay? We know some did, and... I would like to think that many did because that was like his whole goal. But if we look at um, John chapter one, just flip back a couple pages there. Uh, John chapter one, verses 35 through 42 talks about specifically two disciples. When John points and says, behold, the lamb of God, they left following John the Baptist and they started following Christ. And that was Andrew and John the Evangelist, who wrote this gospel. Both of them were originally disciples of John the Baptist, and then they were following Jesus. And that was, to him, like to John the Baptist, you know, the way he describes it here um, in verse 29 of chapter 3, he says, therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. That was the whole point. I got, I, I, I brought people along, I've been training them in the Word of God, and I pointed them to Christ, and they followed him. Boom. That's what we were all about. But you guys that are coming to me and you're whining that so many people are following Jesus, clearly you haven't been listening. I, I told you I'm not the Messiah. Like if you want to be following the, the important guy, you're following the wrong guy. Go follow Christ. Yeah. Good question. I think it's kind of interesting that Jesus has some of the same issues with his disciples a couple of years later, you know, where he's been with them for three years and they totally missed the boat on what he's been telling them too. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and and I and I resemble that remark. Okay. <laughs> right. right. I mean, they, uh, I'm only 36, and it wasn't until my son was born that all sorts of things I just wasn't even paying attention to. I wasn't studying it about. I I I thought I had the Bible licked. I like you know I know what's in the Bible. And my son was born, and God put it on my heart to, to answer very hard questions like, how am I going to know my son's going to be saved? That's a hard one. That'll drive you into some study. That's what it did for me. And that's when I, the more I studied, the more I began to learn, what have I been doing this whole time? 
it's like I've just been phone, and I've been a Sunday school teacher for a long time, and I felt like I've just been phoning it in. I've been spoon feeding people milk sandwiches. You know, I this is there's no meat, and because I didn't understand, and so yeah, I I totally get that. You know that they were with him that long, and they just still didn't get it. And one of the things, if we were to look at, um, I don't think it's in John. I think it's in maybe Matthew. The end of Matthew. No, it's at the end of Luke. So just flip back a couple of pages. We're right at the beginning of John. Flip back a couple of pages to the beginning of Luke. The end of Luke. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through um, 49. I won't read the whole thing. But here Jesus is um, appears to the disciples and he just uh, appears among them and they're sort of taken aback and surprised. And they, they're support, surprised at what's going on. And then for, in verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then this, this next verse is so revealing. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Like it, it takes, it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to get this. And so you may hear it one time or you may read it one time and go, yeah, I got it. And you don't because the Holy Spirit hasn't opened your mind to understand it yet. And I'm not saying that in a mystical way. I'm saying that there are spiritual things here and they can only be discerned spiritually. They can't be discerned uh, in, in the flesh. And so as you study the Bible and as you, you know, as you try to teach it to your kids, please teach it to your kids, number one, that as you do either of those, always pray that the Holy Spirit help you to understand it. Or you're going to end up like John's disciples and I'll end up like John's disciples going, I think I know what's going on and I really don't. Yep. All right. We got 10 minutes left. Um, let's keep going. Let's finish John chapter three. So in my Bible, um, the quotation ends at 30, but there's no punctuation in the Greek there to help us know where John the Baptist stops talking and John the evangelist starts talking. Either way, the rest of chapter three here is still true. And it's talking about Christ. And whether it comes out of John the Baptist's mouth or it comes out as commentary by John the Evangelist writing this after that conversation, um, doesn't really matter. What matters is what it's telling us about Jesus. So uh, let's see, who read last? Matt or Ben? I think Ben, ben did. I can okay. read. Matt, what's your, your, your name? Is Marie? I want you to read 31 through 36. <clears throat> the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth is earthly and speaks in earthly terms. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony is, has affirmed that God is true. For the one whom God sent speaks God's words, since he gives the spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life, but the one who rejects the Son will not see life. Instead, the wrath of God remains on him. Good. All right. A couple of things going on here. One is we get a, a now a contrast between John the Baptist and Jesus. And so I think John the Baptist here is what he's referring to by he who is of the earth. Um, he is of the, of the earth, little earth, little earth. Um, and then we're, that's contrasted with Jesus. Jesus is from above. It also says that he's from heaven. And we see here a similar sentence construction, a similar grammatical declaration to what we saw in John chapter one. Here it says, he bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. 
this this no one is a is an absolutely no one. No one receives his testimony. Jesus is coming and he's testifying to what he's seen and heard in heaven. He's teaching about heavenly things, and no one receives his testimony. And then he turns right around in the very next sentence and says, Whoever receives his testimony, wait a minute, is it no one or is it whoever? Well, let's reread a similar passage to that. Back in John chapter 1, flip a page or two back to John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. It says, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. His own people here referring to the Jews. Jesus was born a Jew. He started his ministry among the Jews. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him. We get that same, well, which is it? None? Because we know some Jews followed him. We've read about one of them in the story today. So here, there's, there's sort of like this uh, superlative language being used here. It's a little bit of hyperbole, as if to say, almost nobody. If we were to look at the whole world, those who hear of Christ, so many reject him that it's almost nobody who receive him. That's the kind of language he's talking about here. But then there's this big but there. There's a but in John chapter 1, and there's an implied but in John chapter 3. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. In other words, when you believe in the one whom God has sent, that's Jesus. And Jesus is proclaiming the words of God, and he's giving the Spirit without measure. And you put your faith and trust in him. You're not just putting your trust in a man named Jesus. You're putting your trust in God who sent him, whose words are uttered by him. And oh, by the way, Jesus is God. When you're putting your faith in him and he's proclaiming that he is God, that's one of his claims, then you're declaring that God is true. You're accepting that. And if you reject Christ, what you're saying is is God is false. God came and proclaimed to you that Jesus is the way of salvation and you rejected it and you're calling him a liar at that point. I don't know about you, but let let every man be a liar and God be true. Okay? I I if anything, God is true and we're the liars. So um here it also says in 35, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He's been given all things. Um This is written past tense because it's as good as given. In other words, in the end of days, God will put all of the nations of the world under Jesus' feet. This is described in the book of Isaiah. This is described in the book of Revelation. And it's so good as as having, that it will happen. This is one of those must things that it's written here in past tense because it's as good as given already. Um, and this last Last part, verse 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is another one of those one verse gospel presentations, sort of like John 3, 16, sort of like John 1, um, 14 in the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, This is another one of those one-sentence gospel presentations. Whoever believes in the Son, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever does not obey, whoever disobeys, shall not have life. And there is a direct correlation drawn in this sentence between believing and obeying. That believing is not just professing. It's one thing for us to celebrate professions. And I I do think we should. If somebody comes to you and says, I received Christ, you better give him a hug. Okay? Give him a hug and put your arm around him and drag him to church so that he can keep studying the Bible. Okay? Because not a profession of faith 
is not the same thing as possession of faith. That one of the ways that the Bible says we can see whether or not someone has true saving faith is by the fruit that's in their life. Fruit it portrayed in the Bible is not new converts that you've personally gone and made. Fruit portrayed in the Bible in the New Testament is the change within your life that the Holy Spirit is working in you because you are now saved, that you're receiving the fruits of the Holy Spirit and that fruit is increasing in you. And so that's this obedience here. To, to, obedience is not just putting your faith in Christ. It's not just saying, well, okay, uh, I want Jesus Christ to be my savior. I nailed it. I got that fire insurance. I'm not going to hell now. Now I can do whatever I want. That's not believing. Here it says believing is also obeying. It's saying, I've got a new master now, and I'm so grateful for the work of salvation that he did for me, for the price that he paid for me, the blood that he shed for me. He dug me out of the pit of sin. You know what? I'm going to study and figure out what he likes, and I'm going to work hard to do that because I want to please him now. I'm not going to do it to earn my salvation, but I want to do it out of my love for him. That's what that is. And so here there's a direct parallel. If somebody comes along to you and says, dude, you're focusing on the law too much, all right? You're worried about obeying all the things. You just need to remember that God is gracious, and if you make mistakes, by the way, if you're in church in a Bible study and somebody starts calling sin mistakes, they're getting it wrong, okay? Sin is an affront to a holy and righteous God. A mistake is a whoops, who cares kind of thing. God cared so much about sin that he did something this drastic about it. We shouldn't take it lightly. So we should seek to obey him. So if somebody says that to you, you just say, thanks, have a nice day, and, and go talk to somebody else. You know what I mean? So that's where we end up at the end of chapter 3. And this is, the, this is the last time that we'll see John the Baptist for a while. Um, Jesus is going to now wander into even more controversial territory in his day, going through Samaria. Um, and we'll learn about that next week. Thoughts? I, was, I thought it was interesting that, that, that uh, John uses that same given two different times in 27 and in, in, uh, in 35. And that ties, ties it up pretty nice, I feel like. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yep. Yep. He does, a, he does a good job with his words here, with the parallels. That's right. <clears throat> How about you, Matt? Thoughts? No gray, just black and white. That's why I like <laughs> him so much. <laughs> good. Uh, Very good. Well, uh, Luke's friends, we didn't get to hear from y'all, but I'm still glad you were here. You're still on, so I hope y'all got to, to listen and you got at least clear audio on your end. Um, feel free to reach out to me and to everybody else that's here in the GroupMe channel, uh, the GroupMe group, I think is what they're called, um, to talk about anything. Y'all want to talk about this lesson? You've got th If you've got things that you want us to be praying for, um, Please, please tell me. My wife and I, we get together and we pray every single night for, for people in our lives and for stuff in our life. And I want to pray for you if we can. So please reach out and tell me about that if you've got something to pray for. Um, well, I want to be respectful of evening family time. So I'm going to wrap it up. And Ben, if you will please close us in prayer. And then we'll sure will. Real, real quick house cleaning. Uh, are we back to Wednesdays next week? Or are we going, you want to stay Thursdays? or? The plan is Wednesdays, if, if that's okay with everybody. Um, one of the things, I'm glad you brought it up. One of the things that I've noticed um, is that in the last couple of weeks, there's been like an explosion of evening church meetings. And instead of having church twice a week, we've got it almost every single day now with different groups and Bible studies and uh, committee meetings and things like that. And I... I want to be sensitive to family time in the evenings because I'm getting beat up about it at home about family times in the evenings. Tracy's saying you're on zoom all day long and then you got to do it again at night. And well, I've still got kids. So um, one of the things that, and I think it's okay to have this on the recording because we're going to be talking about this as an announcement. Um, the girls are doing an overflow like they did last year. 
the ladies are. And Andrea is going to teach that, but we can't meet in the church currently to do that. So she may do it as like a Facebook live kind of thing. And the men last year piggybacked on the popularity of the ladies thing to have a thing for men. And my wife and mother-in-law made treats just to make sure the men stayed long enough to hear the whole lesson. And I can't, I can't bring treats, but I may try to do an overflow kind of thing over the summer. Now, if that's the case, we might break up this class for the summer and just do those six dates. And that way, if folks are off doing vacation or whatever, that's fine. The other thing that I thought about was meeting on another time during the day. Um, but I know most responsible men get to work much earlier than I do. I work in this chair. So um, if it's earlier than like, I don't know, Tracy's been sleeping until nine. So if it's earlier than that, I can't have it right here. She'll have a duck. So... <laughs> Thoughts, ideas, or we, or we can talk Wednesdays, about it. In the Wednesdays would be better for me, but mm -hmm. that's I, I'm, that's just me. So, mm -hmm. Ben, I don't know about any other guys, but. Um, gotcha. <clears throat> yeah, I can, Wednesdays are okay. During the day, during been, the day is tough because I'm, I'm up by 7. I'm, 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 on, I'm online by 7, and I'm going. Mm -hmm. but, but, again, that's just me, so. Yeah, I can, I do, Wednesdays are all right. I just well, my, my D group's meeting on Wednesday night too, so it gets a little close, uh -huh. kind of close you know. <laughs> so, but either way, it doesn't. You know, it's what. Yeah, I, I I tell you what. I mean that that guy that's leading that group, and everybody's going to him. These D groups. <laughs> Nobody's staying with us. <laughs> you like that? That's full circle. <laughs> I'm glad you're in a D group. I think those are awesome. And they, um, especially because they have more of an accountability for, um, format than this does. Like I like teaching, uh, I I'm good at teaching in this style and I could probably lead a D group, but, um, I think they're both good. They're good, but just different ways of learning or studying. I agree. You can do both or you could pick one. Doesn't matter to me. If you're in the word, you're in the right place. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, we've, we've beaten it all around the bush on that one. So I'll go ahead and, and hang up, but I'm glad that, um, that y'all were here and, um, and I've enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing all of you again in person. Thank you for having it. And unless you fight me off with a stick, I'm going to give you all a hug when I see you next. <laughs> okay. Sounds good, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm fist pumping you. There we go. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Guys. I love you guys. See you later. Bye, brother. Bye.